Navigator to pilot. Go ahead, Ben. Coast of Holland, just ahead. Good. Pilot to bombardier. Open bomb base and prepare to bomb. Right. Bomb doors open. Navigator to pilot. We're over the target. There's West Capella. And there's the Great Dyke. Pilot to bombardier. Target below. She's all yours. I need a little left. No, no, too much. Give me a little right. Just a little. There. Steady now. Hold what you've got. That's it. Hold it. Steady. Hold it. Bombs away. Mission accomplished. The long train of bombs hurtles earthward and the great dike at West Capella in Holland is breached. The ocean pours through the spreading holes, washing over the land, drowning out the gun emplacements of the Germans. Modern warfare? Well, not exactly modern. A Dutchman thought of the same strategy 400 years ago. His name was William the Silent. He wasn't a silent man at all. It is his story we tell tonight. His story and the story of another time in history, when Holland was fighting for its freedom. And the Dutch broke the dikes. <laughs> The NBC University of the Air presents Chapter 7 of We Came This Way, a new historical series for our listeners at home and overseas. With John W. Vandercook as narrator, we present Chapter 7, a story of how the Dutch broke the dikes in We Came This Way. In the year 1555, Charles V of Spain gave up his throne and retired to a monastery. A tired old man, swollen with gout and sick of conquest. Forget him, but remember his son and successor. Philip II, by the grace of God, King of Spain. Caesar Augustus, Lord of the Earth. Absolute dominator in Asia, Africa, and America. Duke of Milan and both the Burgundies. Hereditary sovereign of the 17 provinces of the Netherlands. Philip was a medieval man in a world where feudalism was crumbling. An autocrat in an age when men were beginning to question authority. Philip tried to turn back the clock. He wanted to check the Reformation, build a gigantic Spanish monarchy, and reduce his other possessions to vassal states almost succeeded. He would have succeeded except for one thing. William the Silent, Prince of Orange, opposed him. Philip sent the Duke of Alba to the Netherlands with an army. William fled for his life. But don't forget William. This is only the prologue to our story. Alva rode into the Netherlands on a white horse with 10,000 soldiers. He looked around him and he saw the fear on people's faces. But he failed to see the anger in their hearts. So he wrote a letter to Philip. I am here. So much is certain. Whether I am welcome is of little consequence. I have tamed men of iron in my day. Shall I not easily crush these men of butter? Violence is the only way with these people. I shall act accordingly. Alva's first act was to establish the Council of Blood. Three months later, he wrote again. I would that all the heads of all his majesty's enemies were upon a single neck, so that I might strike them off with one blow. To date, I have had killed 1,800 heretics. But even Alva was too slow for Philip. In February 1568, he had the Inquisition pass sentence upon the Netherlands. Let it be made known that through this holy office, all inhabitants of the Netherlands, with the few exceptions noted below, are herewith condemned to death as heretics. And let it be further known that this sentence is to be carried out immediately without regard to age, sex, or condition. 
Never before or since was a whole nation sentenced to death. Even children went to the stake. The whole population of the Netherlands might have been swallowed up in one vast grave if William the Silent had been a different kind of man. But he was what he was. So in exile by almost superhuman effort, he assembled an army. Then he came back to the Netherlands to liberate the people, to fight for what he valued more than his life. What William fought for was something new in the world. It was an idea, freedom of conscience. And it is being fought for even today. Yes, I came back. There is a time, I think, in every man's life when he must choose between inaction and struggle. I came back to lead the people against the Duke of Alva and the greatest army in Europe. My army was a people's army, a ragged, undisciplined, but savagely loyal force. We called ourselves beggars. For beggars was the name the king's regent had given us years before when we had gone to petition against Alva's coming. For two years we fought. A losing fight. I saw my three younger brothers killed in battle. Saw Antwerp ravaged. Saw Zutphen fall, Harlem fall. Then, when I lay ill of fever at Delft and powerless to stop them... I saw the Spaniards under Valdez march on the city of Leiden and Holland. If Leiden surrendered, all was lost. The people of the Netherlands could stand no more defeat. But at Leiden, where General Valdez was proposing terms of surrender to the Burgomaster... You are a fool, Burgomaster. A stubborn fool. I am offering the people of Leiden pardon and mercy if you surrender the city at once. Pardon and mercy, do you understand? I understand, General Valdez, that the flute sounds sweet when the fowler lures the bird. We know what happened at Harlem when they surrendered. The Spanish mercy, Spanish fury. You know the alternative to surrender. Yes, yes, we know. Very well. The arrangement suits us admirably. We lay siege. We wait outside the walls while you starve inside. The Spanish army has no other engagements. You are cool now, Burgomaster. But you will change your tune. I tell you that Leiden will be taken. If I fall in the siege, my son will come and take my place. If he falls, my second son will take his place. And if he falls, then my wife will come from Spain to take his place. And who will take your wife's place, General Valdez? My name is Peter van der Werf. I was the burgomaster of Leiden. And I do not want you to think that I was a brave man. I did what I did because sometimes a man has but one choice. We had lived for five years under Alva. Nothing worse could happen to us after that. So the Spanish army waited outside Leiden for us to starve inside. And we waited for the prince to send us aid. Two months went by, and every day there was a little less food than the day before. Then one day... Peter? Peter? Yes, Anna? There's a boy outside. He says his name is Dirk van Ziel. He has two pigeons in a cage. Pigeons? Uh, Tell him to come in, Anna. I'll tell him. Burgomaster, I had to see you. Uh, What is it, lad? What do you want? To save Leiden, sir. Save Leiden? How will you save Leiden? Isn't it true, sir, that you've been trying to get a message to the prince to send us help? Yes, it's true. And that both couriers you sent were captured by the Spanish? And tortured. I could get to Delft, sir. You? I know the road like the palm of my hand. I could do it blindfolded. Yes, but the Spanish would not be blindfolded. I could slip out at night. I know where there's a hole in the wall, grown over with weeds. Only a boy could get through. I could slip past the sentry. And and suppose they saw you? I'd run. 
I'd hide under the bank of the canal. Or I'd lie flat in the water with my nose out. I tell you, sir, I could get to Delft. Hmm. Uh, how old are you, lad? Sixteen. But what you need for the trip is a boy, sir. Not a slow, old man, fat with drinking too much beer. But if you did manage to sneak out of the city and get to the prince with a message, you'd never be able to get back in with the prince's answer. I'd not try to return, sir. Yeah, but the object of the trip is to bring back word from the prince. I wouldn't come back, sir. But my pigeons would. You see, sir, they're homing pigeons. Go on, lad. Tell me more of Leiden. Well... The food is almost gone, sir. And some talk of surrender. They say... Uh, well, they say that you have deserted us. No, lad. The fair maid of Holland has had many suitors. But she chose me above all others. I'll not desert her. You'll send an army to help us? If I had an army, I'd have sent it long ago. It was cut to pieces at Mukerheide. The only force I have left is the fleet. The sea beggars. Oh, but Leiden's not on the sea. How could you send the sea beggars to Leiden? By sending the sea to Leiden first. What's that, sir? If the dikes were broken, the whole lowland between here and Leiden would be flooded. Of course, the dikes. I'd never thought of it. Well, then why not break the dikes, sir? I would have long ago... Wanted to from the minute Leiden was besieged. Then why? The estates general. Oh, they won't agree to it. No, not yet. But they must decide. And what about Leiden, sir? Will we be left to starve to the last man? No, lad, I've not given up. Tomorrow I go back to Rotterdam to meet with the estates once more. And may God in his mercy... Give me the wisdom to make them see. The prince's proposal to break the dikes was fantastic when he made it two months ago. I, it is still I, fantastic. I, I, Five I, centuries our people have labored to push back the sea. Is all their work to be destroyed now? If the dikes are broken, it will flood the Rhineland, the Delftland, the Skiland. And all the adjoining districts. I myself stand to lose many thousand guilders by the flooding of the land. I will... We will now hear from His Excellency the prince. Gentlemen, I make my last appeal to you. If Leiden falls, then Holland will be cut in two. With Leiden will collapse our last hope. The Netherlands will once more be at the mercy of the tyrant. You know what this means. You have seen the streets of your cities running with blood. You have shuddered in your homes and waited for the knock on the door that would drag you off to the gallows. If you have escaped and thousands of your countrymen have died, died for a simple thing, a God-given thing, a thing that men should enjoy as freely as they breathe fresh air. The freedom to worship God as the conscience directs. Think not of your purses now, but of that freedom. Not of a parcel of land, but of those who will come after you to inherit that for which we fight. Do this thing I ask of you. Empower me to break the dikes and send the ocean to Leiden. And I tell you, what you do here today will be remembered. All generations to come will call you blessed.
the Estates General yielded. And on the third day of August, 1574, I stood on the great outer dike near Rotterdam with my chief engineer. It was an ordinary summer day, daisies in the meadows, crows in the grain fields, a lazy wind turning the windmills. A crowd had gathered, and we bowed our heads for a moment. God grant us to succeed in this undertaking. God bless Harland. God keep Leiden. Are you ready now, Your Excellency? Yes, I'm ready. At the sound of the cannon, let the work go forward. Let the dike be pierced and the ocean come in. Ready, set, fire. The dike was broken. All the patient effort of five centuries destroyed. At Skidam and Rotterdam, the floodgates were opened and the water leaped forward, washing over the orchards, the grain fields and the meadows. Where fat cows had grazed was now the bottom of the sea. But even as men watched, their earthly possessions vanish. They knew a great exaltation. Afterwards, they might carp and haggle and criticize. But for the moment, their vision was pure, unobstructed. They looked upon the desolation and saw something else. The waters of freedom washing over the lowlands. The boy's pigeon came back to Leiden with the message that the dikes had been broken... And we were wild with relief and hope. It was a foolish thing I did, but the end seemed so near. I gave the order. Hear ye, hear ye, by the order of the Burgomaster, rations of food will be doubled. Let all good men and true praise God. The ocean is on its way to Leiden. Leiden will be saved. A week passed. The last of our food was eaten. And still the ocean did not come. The plague came instead. Plague and famine worked silently together. The church bells tolled a thousand dead the first week. The second week passed. Dogs, cats, rats, everything that lived but man was killed and eaten. Another thousand died. And still there was no sign of the water. The third week, people were chewing on old shoe leather eating the bark of trees, the roots, and swelling up and dying. An inch or two of water, but no more, had crept feebly across the meadows about Leiden. And Spanish soldiers stood below the city walls and mocked us. Hola, <laughs> Leideners! Where is your miracle? Why aren't you expecting an ocean? Well, tell your friends to work another miracle. And invent a boat that can sail on dry land. <laughs> By the end of the fourth week, 7,000 were dead of the famine and pestilence. My wife, Anna, was one of them. No one could bear to hear the church bells toll any longer. So, I ordered them to cease. And that was how it was with Leiden when General Valdez unbuckled his sword and paid me another visit. Senor Burgomaster. What is it you would have of me now, General Valdez? I've come for the last time to offer you pardon and mercy, if you will surrender. You had your answer four months ago. Four months ago, you had hope. A faint hope that your prince might send you help. But now you have nothing, 
You lie. A month ago, the dikes were cut. But did the water come to Leiden? No, senor. Even God mocks you. He has made the wind stop blowing. The water sinks instead of rising. The prince's fleet, my courier tells me, is stuck in the mud two miles from where it started. You see, senor, your last hope is gone. No, General Valdez, you are wrong. We live, and as long as we live, we have hope. Pardon me, senor, but we Spanish are not fools. We know you have nothing between you and starvation but a few mangy dogs and cats. Then, as long as you hear a dog bark or a cat mew, know that Leiden holds out. You wait like vultures to pick our bones. But know this, General Valdez. When our last hour comes and we can fight no more, we will set fire to the city and die in the flames. Nothing will be left for you. Nothing. What's that? In God's name, where's that music coming from? From the people, General. The people of Leiden, whom you say are beaten. Today we celebrate the birthday of the Prince of Orange. May God forgive the Burgomaster that lie. It was not my birthday. He had ordered the town musicians out and the people to parade so that Valdez would not know their desperation. I was desperate, too. I had counted on wind and tide to carry the seawater to lighten. But for weeks, not a breath of air had stirred. The sea beggars were founded in a sea of mud. On the night of October 1st, I stood on the dike the dike I had breached with so much hope. With me was the boy, Dirk Van Ziel. The water's like a mirror. I never saw it so still. Do you believe in miracles, lad? Yes, sir. I think I do. Good. They say they only happen to those who believe in them. Oh, it would be a miracle, wouldn't it, sir, if the wind should suddenly rise and blow the ocean to Leiden. You think that would be asking too much? Oh, no, sir. God has willed it. It will happen. I see you are a good Calvinist. Yes, sir. <laughs> what is it? Oh, God bless you, sir. <laughs> are you taking cold, sir? No, it's nothing. Oh. What? Nothing, did you say? Listen. It's the wind. The wind has changed. And the sea is moving. <laughs> There were three feet of water in the meadows about Leiden by October 4th. And another of Dirk's pigeons had returned with the message that the fleet, the sea beggars, were on their way to save us. I kept watch till almost daybreak, then dropped off to sleep. I was awakened. Burgermaster! I'm coming. I'm coming. What is it, men? The city wall is falling. No, no, it can't be. But it's true, sir. The wall between the cow gate and the Tower of Burgundy has fallen. Then the Spaniards have mined it. They mean to attack us before the fleet comes. They'll be in the city before it is light. What are we to do, Burgomaster? Do? We fight them, of course. Listen, the captain of the guard is calling out our men. Every man, woman, and child in Leiden who is not too weak to stand lined up in orderly array before the fallen wall. The home guard had guns. The rest had pikes, axes, hammers, hay forks. The women had their kitchen knives. A few held lighted torches. We knew what we would do. As long as we could, we would fight the Spaniards off. Then we would set fire to the city and die in the flames. While we waited for dawn and for the enemy to attack, we prayed. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and the noisome pestilence. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by day, nor of the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor of the destruction 
wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Listen, the cock crows in the Spanish camp. It's growing light in the east. People of Leiden, the Spaniards will come now. Remember our oath. Death, but no surrender. Look, they're coming. Where? There, creeping through the mist. There's one of them. Wait. Halt! Halt or we fire! He's Dutch. Who is it? Who goes there? Dirk Van Zeel. Dirk Van Zeel. What are you doing coming from the Spanish lines? But don't you know? The Spaniards are gone. Gone? Where? They went toward the Hague. They rode past me as I came in. Then why did they mine the wall? Maybe they didn't, sir. Maybe the sea that's bringing the fleet undermined the wall. And the fleet is coming. Of course it's coming. Why do you think the Spaniards fled? Listen, lad, listen. That's the fleet now. The beggars. They're saluting us! Thanks be to God! God bless Holland. God keep Leiden. God be praised. Get it, a pilot? Go ahead, Van. Coast of Holland just ahead. Good. Po- pilot to Bombardier. Open bomb base and prepare to bomb. Right. Bomb doors open. Navigator to pilot. We're over the target. There's West Capella. And there's the Great Dyke. Pilot to Bombardier. Target below. She's all yours. I need a little left. No, no, too much. Give me a little right. Just a little. There. Steady now. Hold what you've got. Once again, the dikes are broken to drive an enemy from the land. And now we who share in this work should remember that we had a stake in that other victory, too. We, you and I, were saved at Leiden. That was the city where, 35 years after the siege that Holland broke, a little band of Englishmen driven out of their own country because of their religion took refuge. Our pilgrim fathers found refuge there because Leiden held and remained free. From Leiden to Plymouth Rock was the way we came. The NBC University of the Air has brought you Chapter 7 of the new historical series, We Came This Way. Next week... We Came This Way will present the story of the Puritan Revolution in England. A handbook containing background information with suggestions for further reading is now in publication. We shall be happy to send you at cost of mailing this valuable We Came This Way handbook, especially written for the current series. Send 25 cents to cover the cost of printing and mailing to We Came This Way, Post Office 30, Station J, New York 27, New York. program is presented by the NBC University of the Air, not only for listeners in this country, but also for our service men and women overseas, to be transmitted to them wherever they're stationed through the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight's script was written by Frank Wells and directed by Ira Avery. The original music was composed by Leo Kempinski and conducted by Milton Catums. Feature roles were played by Lon Clark, Rock Rogers, Owen Jordan, and Ruth Amos. The narrator was John W. Vandercook. This series is presented as a public service of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Mm-hmm.